See, there's the critical one. The critical one is whether or not you are your thoughts. We grew up, some of us even grew up learning Latin in the old days, and we grew up with the statement, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. It turns out that it would be more to the mark to say, I am and I think. Thinking is a power that you and I have. It allows us to symbolize. It allows us to remember, to plan, to define ourselves, to know who we think we are. It's such an incredibly interesting and fascinating power. Like there's a Chinese curse, may you be born in a fascinating time, which I love. Because you get lost into it. Well, you get lost into the power of your thinking mind. Look at what we can do with our thinking minds. I mean, this auditorium is a product of thinking mind. All of, our, all of the handmaiden of thought technology the stepchild, rather, is all uh, part of the thinking mind's manifestations. In fact, most of us live almost entirely within the projections of the thinking mind. You're living in a room that is square. Notice very few things in nature are square, but the thinking mind creates sharp, flat planes and so on. We are eating food that has been thought through. It's been taken from the way it started and it's been redone through the thinking mind. Modified, prepared, we call it. We live very much in our minds. And when you live, the thinking mind, while it's an exquisite power, I mean, we developed in, in terms of Darwinian evolution, we developed a number of interesting things. First, we learned how to be upright bipeds. That was a great advantage over you know, that one. And we learned this prehensile capacity, thumb, index, finger opposition, so we could pick things up. That was a big one. And then we got these big prefrontal lobes. You notice some of our old uncles don't have them. They're from the eyebrows right back, it goes flat. We developed these big thinking machines, which developed all this symbolic power. And that really set us apart as a species. This thinking mind, which is so incredibly powerful, the Easterners know, they say, don't get caught in, your, in the cities that come along the way. S-I-D-D-H-I-S, -I -I which means the, the powers that you develop along the way. And one of the powers you and I have is the power of this intellect. Well, it's like the power to know we know. Well, I really know that. But it's beginning to dawn on us that there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom because we are beginning to see a lot of people who know a lot of stuff, but they are not very wise. Do you notice that? I mean, we have a lot of them in politics. <laughs> like Henry Kissinger is a very knowledgeable man, but I very rarely feel a sense of great wisdom in his being. I don't mean to put him down, he's just another being like us. But I think what we have worshipped in a culture that worships the intellect is we have worshipped knowledgeable people rather than wise people. And there's a way in which you and I, the way we are gathered here tonight and what we're doing here, <clears throat> is we are in wise person training. And wisdom has a certain innocence to it. And it's different than the intellect. 
Because it turns out that the intellect is only one way of knowing the world. We think of it as the only computer program in town. And for years, in our kind of, uh, in a kind of chauvinistic way, we said, well, tough-minded people, they're the really, that's it. Then there are these wishy-washy people, very often women, we said, who use intuition. You'd say, how do you... How do you know that's going to happen? And she would say, intuition. You'd say, oh, you women. I mean, this is an old movie, an old B movie from years back. Well, bizarrely enough, it turns out that the intuitive mind heart is a more profound way of knowing the universe than the analytic, intellectual, linear mind. But it isn't as if we have to choose one versus the other. We've, both, we've got both of them. The only thing we have to change is the relative power positions of them. Because most of us are functioning, trusting our rational minds, and often rejecting our intuition. Animals don't reject their intuition. Babies don't. It's very funny because being a holy man as I am, I come into somebody's home and they have a baby, you see. And now when, if you're a beautiful, loving being like I am, the baby is supposed to coo and giggle. And I walk in, the baby goes, wah! And I, I'm saying, nice baby, nice baby, you know, hello, hello, you old Tibetan Lama, you. And, you know, and it's terribly embarrassing. I mean, how can I be somebody so holy if the baby is seeing right through me? <laughs> Dogs go, grrr, you know, I mean, you know that feeling when you go in and you're feeling all loving and the dog goes, grrr, and you think, gee, what did he see? What did the dog see? Because you know the dog is sensing usually its own paranoid projections, but... <coughs> and the baby may have a gas bubble, who knows? I mean, there's all infinite possibilities of explanation. But if you're unsure and you needed the baby and the dog's intuition to re tell you you're okay, that's using the environment for feedback, using those feedback loops all the time. That's because you don't think you are okay. The problem with being stuck in your thinking mind is that the thinking mind thinks about things. So it thinks about the world. So you are always the distance of one thought away from life because everything becomes an object. And if you watch the evolution of this interesting process of the addiction to the thinking mind over millennia, thousands of years anyway, you've watched people going from where they would allow their intuitive feelings to be at play among humans and even animals at first, but they thought about physical uh, um, non-organic phenomena or something like that. And then pretty soon they started to think about other people because they said, well, I can't really trust all these people. Some of them are them. They're not all us. So I better think about them, watch them, think about them. But among the family, the tribe, at least it's us. And I can just function the way a river functions or a tree, just intuitively. Then as the world progressed into civilization, supposedly, or Western civilization of the thinking mind. Gandhi said civilization is, um, is, uh, 
the art of voluntary renunciation. Somebody said, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I didn't know there were any. Uh, I don't think he would have said something as nasty as that, but that's what they say, Gandhi said. As civilization evolved, it got to the point where you said, well, I can't, or not only can't trust all those people, but you know, even in my own tribe, there are some people that will be watched. But the one thing I've got is my family. And then things progressed and you said, well, you know, in the family, you know, there's this generational difference and my parents don't really understand me. Well, my kids really are different. I better think about it and watch it. I mean, at least I can be intuitive with my spouse or people of my own generation or grew up in what we call an alienated society. I'm not sure I trust me. I mean, these neuroses, I'll go to a therapist and discuss him. And I become an object to myself. And I am feeling even isolated from my own, from my, my own identities. The thinking mind isolates. It keeps, it keeps reinforcing your sense of separateness. Because you are always thinking about objects. And the more you think inward, self-reflect, the more even you become an object to yourself until the whole universe is objects and it's like you're in a plastic telephone booth, which you're screaming because you're starving to death even though you're rubbing bodies and making love and do you love me and do I love you and here we are. But it's all thinking. You're thinking, you're making love through thinking, you're relating through thinking and you've scrunched down that intuitive space. Because the power of thought is it gives you, a, you as a separate entity some sense of security, like you've got control of the situation. I know where it's at. What Florence Cluckholm, the anthropologist, calls man societies in which it's man over nature. Control and mastery are the games of the West. We are busy being in control and mastery games. I can wipe out the mosquitoes. I'll get rid of everything that gets in the way of me may having paradise. And I'll be in control of it. There is a, a point in this sequence that I'm talking about, right at this point now, where you've gone that whole trip and you recognize that no matter how hard you think, you are not going to be able to experience the thing you are yearning to experience, which is a feeling of contentment or a feeling of at-homeness or a feeling of well-being or a feeling of it's all right or a feeling of harmony with things a feeling of being in the flow, a feeling of yes, of, of affirmation, of yeah, okay. A feeling of isness. Because the thinking mind is an actor and you're busy being an actor. You're busy being identified with you as an actor. Like if I'm speaking to you and you're listening to me, are you an audience and am I a lecturer? Well, there is lecturing going on and there's an audience listening, but behind it all, here we are. You here, you can be busy being an audience if you want to. I am fulfilling my role as a speaker as impeccably as I'm able to do that. But that isn't my identity. It's a relative reality. It's not absolutely real. We are using words, but they're like birds. From my point of view, they come out of the void and they go back into the void. And behind them all, here we are. Just here. No labels, just here. It's the only way. If, if you can't label it, how do you know you know that you exist? You don't. But are you here? I'm here. So what's the big problem? But the thinking mind isn't satisfied. How do I know I exist? You don't. 
You see, what it is, if, you were, if you're into logic, it is a subsystem, it's a subset trying to include the set, the meta-set within itself. It's like Palm Springs trying to include California. And it can't. It's part of a larger system. And California is part of the United States. The United States is part of the hemisphere. And the hemisphere is part of the Earth. And the Earth's part of the solar system. The solar system is part of the galaxies. Da, 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 da. And so the intellectual analytic mind is only a subset. It's only a part of the game. And it's a great, powerful, delightful thing, but it's a great servant, but it is an absolutely lousy master. It ends up leaving you alienated and isolated and busy being separate. And there comes a point in the dance of life or lives or rounds when you begin to recognize that fact that you aren't who you think you are that you have been giving yourself short shrift, that the game is much more interesting than that. And when you start to allow yourself to recognize that, you look back on your life and you see how many times in your life you knew that already, but you were busy not knowing it. Because it didn't, wasn't something you could think about. I remember being with my mother when she was dying and uh, I was in the hospital room and she was on morphine and I was on mescaline, I think. And we were holding hands and uh, we were just out there and there was no mother and there was no child. We were just these two beings in space reflecting about life and death and stuff and it was just one of the most beautiful experiences I'd ever had with my mother. The next day I came into the hospital room and she was off the morphine that day. And I said, wasn't that a lovely day we had yesterday? Wasn't that a beautiful space? She said, it was disgraceful. They had me on drugs. Okay. At that moment, I saw that the minute she didn't have that chemical in her, the attachment she had to being who she thought she was was so strong that she really wasn't ready to recognize this other part of her being in this lifetime. Now, I use words like in this lifetime and sooner or later you begin to notice you aren't who you thought you were. And sneaking around on the edge of this is the issue of reincarnation. Some of you say, well, I'll go just so far, but when you get to reincarnation, you've just gone. Uh, okay. And in fact, in uh, the Bible, in the councils of Constantinople, Nicaea, and Trent from about 300 to 586 or something like that, they selected what would end up in the Bible and they selected out most of the stuff that, in fact, almost all the stuff that had to do with reincarnation because it, it undercut the church. Because if you were just coming through here, passing through in another round, it didn't have the same powers as if this was the one. Oh, here I am again, what do you know? Ah, oh, life, ah, oh, death. Oh, that was a quick one. I mean, we're a little bit like, um, there are these images of how many times you've been born. Like as many as grains of sand on a beach or something like that, or a mountain six miles long and six miles wide and six miles high, and every hundred years, one bird flies over the mountain with a silk scarf in its mouth and runs the scarf across the top of the mountain. In the length of time it takes for the silk scarf to wear away the mountain. That's how long you've been doing this. So you're like one of those little bugs that's born in the morning and dies in the evening and around noon it says, this is life. <laughs> See, now I'm talking about a different kind of evolution than Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution is the creation of the package in which you find yourself. 
and you went through your Neanderthal period and on and on and on. On this particular round, on this particular planet, who you are is quite a different ball game, quite a different matter in time. You say, well, is reincarnation real? No, but are you? I mean, my father used to say, come down to reality, Richard. And I couldn't find it. That was my problem. <laughs> the reality that he said to come down to was relatively real. It was the same thing when I went through school. I took physics, and I was taught the Newtonian physics was absolutely the way it was. Then along came a guy named Albert Einstein. And he said, well, it's not exactly wrong. It's just relatively real. It's real under certain conditions, and it's called the theory of relativity. And he took my old Newtonian physics. He didn't make a lie out of it. He just took it off the pedestal of being absolutely real. And what you have done and I have done and many of us have done is those experiences we've had in which we have been in another way of knowing the universe, we have treated either as hallucinations or I was dreaming or I was, uh, gee, I, I don't know, I just don't know where I was just now. We have ways of treating it, reducing it out so that we can come back into the control we feel with our thinking minds. The problem is we are reinforcing our own sense of separateness. And in that world of separateness, you're constantly locking doors to protect something. and feeling drier and drier in the process. You're turning off the life juice, the flow of the universe, just in order to protect something. Once that awakening moment starts, once that happens and you recognize you aren't who you thought you were, and you acknowledge that, you just say, yeah, there's my thinking mind, and it defines all this, but behind it all, here I am. I just am. I'll tell you how far out it gets when you keep working it. You see, I am, and then there is this body, and there is this personality, and it comes and it goes, and this is aging. This foot is older than it was 20 years ago. Interesting. And here I am. Who you are, if you can sense this for a second, who you are is neither born nor does it die. Who you are neither comes nor goes. Who you are just is. You could call it awareness. Call it isness. Any word you call it is just a word that your thinking mind creates to try to get hold of it. But you can't get hold of who you are. You just are it. And the minute you can relax into this interesting, intuitive allowance, acceptance, spacious presence, the whole meaning of the game changes. I was told a reincarnation story the other day I must share with you. It was two, um, Itzhak and Moshe were discussing reincarnation. And they agreed that since they weren't sure about it, that whoever died first would send a message back. So Itzhak died first and Moshe went to a medium. And as Moshe walked into the room, he heard, Moshe! Moshe. He says, Yitzhak, is that you? Yes, Moshe. Yitzhak, what are you doing there? Yitzhak says, each day I get up, I eat, I have sex, I rest, I eat, 
I have sex, I rest, I eat, I have sex, I rest. Moshe says, Itzhak, you're in heaven. Itzhak says, heaven, hell, I'm a moose in Idaho. I mean, you've dreamed at night. And then you wake up and you say, boy, that was a dream. And have you ever had the experience where you wake up and you say, that was a dream, and then you later find you're still in a dream? You're dreaming within a dream? Ever had that experience? Huh. Well, wait till you wake up from this one. I could have sworn I was sitting in an auditorium in Palm Springs. You were there. I'm telling you, Sam, you were there. It was so real. Have you ever said that in the morning? <laughs> Why do you think this one isn't? No, this is reality. I'm awake. Ha, 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 ha. That's all I can say to you. <laughs> the game is just much more fun than most people are playing it because they're busy being somebody. Now, functionally, we have to be somebody. We can't relate other than through our somebodyness, but you don't have to get lost in it. I'm like a renter, Ram Das. You rent me and you wind me up and out comes Dharma. That's it. I mean, I'm a, I don't take myself seriously. I'm not busy being bald or 50 or, or a holy man or a teacher or anything. I am, and this is the stuff I do. This is my gig.